I mean, it's outrageous that I'm sitting here in Decatur, Georgia, and you guys are sitting there in Texas, and Brad is sitting up there in North Carolina, and we're all sitting here having this conversation. And why can we do that? When you think right. about the technology behind this, you know, the last, without two or 300 years, really going back to the Renaissance times, this accumulated curve, this arc of learning that we've been, this ascending arc of learning that we've been in since the Renaissance has basically led to us being able to sit here and do this. Right. And, and again, you can't understand that without understanding it within the larger context of the natural environment the global environment, uh, the, the, the changing environment, because it is changing. And it requires constant adaptation. And that's the thing. If there's, I think there's a, people out there now that are imagining there's some, some stability, some stable state that we're supposed to try to achieve. And once we get that stable state, we can kick back and there's not going to be any more extreme weather or, or, or you know, great tremendous hurricanes or, or fires or droughts or any of the other stuff that's been quite normal throughout the history of the earth. Um, but so here's the challenge. Define to me, tell me when is, when was that stable state that we're that mythical stable state that we're trying to um, return to? That's a question that needs to be asked of those that who believe that there is some optimum state that we we can get to and i can imagine an optimum state and i don't think it's anything that we've been in the last two or three hundred years to tell you the truth and in right. fact if we go back seven or eight thousand years there was a period of climate that the climatologist the paleoclimatologist mm -hmm. referred to as the hypsothermal but it was originally referred to as the climatic optimum yeah see and you know guess what it was about a degree or two warmer than the planet is today so that's that's interesting. So, and it's also interesting that the terminology shifted at about the time global warming became a political issue when the the, the terminology went from the climatic optimum, which carries a, a very definite implication to the hypsothermal, because when you think hypsothermal, that doesn't necessarily invoke the same idea, the same picture of a benign climate as the climatic optimum. Right. Right. And, and that, that the climactic optimum takes place right after or close to within a couple of thousand years of enormous uh, cataclysms in the climate. Right. Yes, that's exactly right. Right. And so uh, so since we're talking about Atlantis, where are we thinking that this civilization was in the climactic optimum or previous to it? Do you think previous? OK, previous Pre to it. previous to it. Yes. The climatic 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 um, climatic climate yeah climatic okay climactic would be like the climax of some something oh, right okay. climatic so yes the climatic optimum some probably it didn't start everywhere simultaneously around the world it was at various places in varying strengths but you could say that between nine and ten thousand years and seemed to be pretty much well in place by 8,000 years, it lasted two to 3,000 years. It didn't end all in the same place. Some places began to cool off sooner than other places. But you had the climatic optimum give way to the neoglacial period. The neoglacial or new glacial period was generally a deterioration of climate that took started in place about the mid Holocene, which is say around 5,000 years ago, five to 6,000 years ago. And in, in it affected the planet differently, depending on where you were. But it was generally overall a deterioration of the global climate from this, the warmth of the climatic optimum into the neoglacial period, which culminated in the Little Ice Age. And the Little Ice Age that was really ran from, say, 13 to 1400, again, it didn't appear uniformly everywhere all at once. And in some places, we're barely affected by the Little Ice Age. But there is certainly enough evidence to, to demonstrate that it was global overall. But so between 13 and 1400 is when you had a, a corresponding deterioration of climate that, that began after the medieval warm period, which, of course, is the, the, the time when the Vikings were colonizing and farming West Greenland. And it's generally considered that the 
that the climate was around a degree, degree and a half warmer on average, in some places, maybe more. In other places, maybe not much difference at all. But, but overall, there was a general increase in, in warmth from about 900 to 1200, right in there, that as we've talked about coincides exactly with the, um, you know, a, a human population expansion, a considerable significant human population expansion, only because the growing season got longer and uh, there was more rainfall in a lot of places, particularly in Europe, and that abundant rainfall and longer growing season allowed for abundant harvests. And successive years of abundant harvests created a lot of food for people to eat and people started living longer, getting bigger. We see actually an increase in, in human stature throughout the, the uh, medieval warm period. And then there was enough, uh, the population grew and after a century or so of the medieval warm period in Europe, the population had grown where you could now ha create enough of a surplus that you could you could develop these armies of craftsmen that were necessary to execute this great enterprise of cathedral building. And that lasted until pretty much what you see is the end of the medieval warm period, which was probably triggered by a couple of back-to-back -back big volcanic eruptions in the late 1200s and then again in the early 1300s. So what happened was you had the, the return of the, the first phases of the Little Ice Age, which brought in cold, and there was a succession of bad years, of cold, damp years in the early 1300s that led to uh, a whole sequence of crop failures, which in turn led to famine, which in turn led to people declining in health, their immune systems got weak, uh, their resistance to disease, and then in the 1340s, you had the bubonic plague that, that was able to, the opportunist, opportunistic disease that swept over Europe. And of course, once you had a third the population wiped out and the rest of the third just trying to do what they can to survive, you're not building cathedrals anymore. So that was kind of the end of it. That was the end of that. And that's why a lot of the cathedrals basically from the high middle ages never got finished was because of this, deterioration of climate. Now, so then what happened is we have the Little Ice Age with varying decades of intensity that lasted until about the mid-19th century. And then it began to ameliorate and it began uh, to steadily warm up. The planet began to steadily warm up and it's been warming up uniformly for about 150 to 170 years. And this is easily demonstrated. Um, we see that the, uh, the glaciers worldwide during the Little Ice Age, they grew to the largest extent, mostly around the world, that they had been since the end of the Great Ice Age. So it's important, that's an important thing that to, to a context in which to place your thinking about when you start talking about glacier recession, is that the glacier recession started from this massive expansion of the glaciers that took place in the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age, in turn, was the culmination of this whole deterioration of climate that began between five and 6,000 years ago that was called the neoglaciation that came in the wake of the climatic optimum, which after, like what you said, came uh, almost immediately after on the heels of a whole succession of these massive catastrophic changes. And it's those catastrophic changes, this, this 3,000 year episode roughly lasting from 11,500 to about 14,500 years ago, it's within that context that we have to place the story of Atlantis.